Hello. How's everybody doing tonight? I feel really awkward using this microphone when we're all so close, but I've been told I need to use the microphone. So um, thank you all so much for being here. I have this huge speech um, written out, but I'm like, I know all you guys, and I think we know each other. But um, I'm Jennifer. I'm the new director of the Sports uh, Product Management Program at U of O, and I'm just really thrilled to be here. I was really pleased to spend some time with all of you in Bend and really appreciated the conversations and your honesty and, and the opportunities we have for you all to be um, change makers in the industry and, and bring innovation and inclusion uh, to the industry because we really need that. So tonight we're doing the U of O Portland Soaring Together speaker series. Um, this is the second event that we've had. Um, it is a collaboration with the UO uh, OEMBA program and the Sports Product Management Program. And it's really an opportunity to bring diverse voices to you um, and experiences outside of the classroom so you can really see the opportunities that are available to you and in the industry to make a change um, and really drive innovation throughout the industry. Um, before I introduce our amazing students who are going to introduce Garen, who I want to thank for joining us tonight. Um, I have a huge amount of thank yous uh, to our team who made this possible. So first of all, I want to thank um, Ellen Devlin-Schmidt, who is the co-founder of this program and um, had confidence in me to come take over as director of this program. And then I also want to thank um, Shirley Gourlay, who's not here tonight, but has been tireless in her efforts to support the program and all of you, and then helping me on board and Leslie on board. So I'm sorry she's not here, but I, I could not... Um, go without recognizing her tonight. And then um, obviously Dean Blonigan for his support of our DEI initiatives and providing grant money so that we can do events like this. And we're really excited to look forward over the next year about how we can more do more DEI events with our student and staff input um, to really make a difference. And then um, also the generous donor, Lawrence Jackson, whose foundation funded the grants. I have a lot of thank yous, you guys, so just bear with me. It's important <laughs> that we, we really give recognition to these people. Um, and then my new team, um, Francine for marketing this event, amazing. Um, Erica for helping with all the logistics. Tyler and Tristan for their work um, with all of our students and, and just my entire team who helped make this happen. And then David, who's you can't see behind the screen up there for his technical support um, and bringing this event live to people who are not able to join us in person. And then um, all of our students, Devin, Sharon, Shania, Chris, Mufaro, um, for really helping spread the word to our students and making diversity a priority. So with that, I want to introduce our two um, students, Sharon and Devin, who are going to introduce Garen. Um, both of them, as you know, are in their um, SPM program and have really been uh, excited about the opportunity to pursue their degree in this program and really bring together their passion for um, sports and outdoor industry with career opportunities. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Sharon. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I feel like there's a little lack of energy here. Let's give a big round of applause for Garen here. Oh. Yeah, let's go. Okay. So Devin and I are really honored to have this opportunity to introduce you to the one and only Garen Strong. Um, I would like to start off this with a little quote that I believe embodies Garen's spirit. Um, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how strong men stumble or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. Garen's okay. life has been shaped by sport, influenced by culture, and amplified by his passions for travel, music, fashion, art, and tech. He's an athlete, an entrepreneur, storyteller, creator, visionary, builder, catalyst, and ultimately a consumer. Growing up in San Jose, Garen learned lessons that only sports could teach you early on, which most of you would agree. And as you all might have learned, Garen spent 11 years at Nike, leading some of the brand's most historic transformation movements, starting with the reinvention of Nike training and football. He has over 15 years of experience in strategy, innovation, marketing, with an extensive focus on brand marketing, product marketing, lifestyle, and merchandising. As a brand marketer, Garen has held a successful track record of creating the most authentic narratives for consumers who obsessed with football as much as he did. His brand marketing success led him to the role of his lifetime with the brand Jordan One. 
In 2020, Garand made the bold move to pursue his entrepreneurial dreams and create his own brand, Circle of Winners, a lifestyle brand rooted in a winning mindset and the commitment to push you and your circle to define winning on your own terms. Garand is the ultimate architect of his narrative with precision, intention, and focus in everything he does. His belief that we go further together has not only unlocked doors to his success, but has also taught him to always bring others along with him. And this also is a reminder for us that why we work in our groups and our teams. Handing over the mic to Devin, who I know is super stoked to talk about Garen's life in football and also his transition as an entrepreneur and leader. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> So following the accolades and the overview of his career that Sharon just shared with us, um, during his time down at, the, down at the University of Oregon, Garen was a student athlete who played during the years of 2004 to 2008. And during his time at the U of O, he had a total of 63 receptions for 580 yards and three touchdowns over his years in Eugene. <laughs> so... After his athletic career concluded, he went on to work for Nike for 11 years, where he worked in brand marketing for Nike football, then on to the global footwear with Jordan brand sportswear and training, and finally senior global footwear for the iconic Jordan 1 franchise. During that time, during that time frame, he worked on a large array of projects that are still remembered to this day. Events such as unveiling the 32 NFL team uniforms in 2012 with the help of rapper Wale, being a part of the team who furthered the partnership between Nike and the University of Michigan, which allowed them to be the first program to rock the iconic Jumpman logo, and to help create over 60 different signature Air Jordan 1s in a collab with the game Fortnite to bring the Air Jordan 1 into the video game. But, but after 11 years, he decided to branch off to create his own startup called Circle of Winners, where he is able to bring his own message being a part of a family that looks to bring confidence to all included. It, from his time as an athlete and in the industry, it shaped his founding beliefs for a Circle of Winners because it takes a group of committed individuals to make a team and it takes, un, and it takes unrelenting passion to win. And this inspires me due to having similar backgrounds of being a former Duck athlete and currently in the transition to moving into the industry as well. Because as a kid, going to the Super Bowl events in my hometown with my father and getting to experience the setup of the new Nike uniforms and knowing that somebody who looks like me and a person of similar background like me makes me feel like I can aspire to not only be the same, but, but be even greater. And with that being said, we would like to extend a warm welcome to Garen Strong to the wow. sport, to the SPM program. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, well, my first question is, would you guys like to go on tour together so you guys can <laughs> introduce me? Um, because that was, yeah, I think that was one of the best intros I've ever heard. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Very in depth. Very yeah, surprising. I don't kind of lost for words for that. So thank you again. Um, my name is Garen Strong. Again, I'm from San Jose, California, and I will just be taking you guys through not only my kind of personal values as well as then getting into product because I know you guys are here for that. And feel free to ask questions throughout the whole process. I like to make it more comfortable and cool and just chilling and we're having a conversation than me actually presenting to you guys and just clicking through slides. Cool? Cool? So I knew right when you started about the men in the arena because I love quotes. So I will start mine with um, the reasonable man. And it's around the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Do you guys understand that? <laughs> cool. Um, so starting just with some, some core values for myself, so personal side, I'm very much into authenticity. I think you should show up as your, your true self, and that's your pure self. I think that's your greatest self. Um, and so with that, you know, will come challenges, will come frustrations, but the more that you show up as yourself, I think at the end of the day, when you're looking yourself in the mirror, you re have the respect for yourself and you can go to sleep knowing that you are who you are. Uh, respect, 
I always start with respect. I always treat people with respect because I don't like to be disrespected. So that's where I start. Integrity is just something that I think you have to have in, in life um, because there's so many things, so many influences, so many kind of situations that can kind of take you off your, your, your square that without integrity, it's the quote of don't stand for anything, fall for everything. And so I think with integrity, that kind of helps you get there. Passion, I'm a passionate person. I love to travel, which you'll see. I love sports and those things that I'm passionate about. I love my friends, my family. You can start to hear in my voice or my tone and things of that nature. So as I go through this, you'll start to hear probably some of that passion come out. And then joy, I always like to bring joy or just be around people that are kind of giving off energy, good energy and joy. Then there's, you know, a secondary kind of around my personal core values and then getting into the professional side, authenticity again, with some of you guys already being in the, the workforce and job force to going back out into the, the workforce is that's one of the things that you, I think, really have to look yourself again in the mirror to see how you want to, you know, present yourself. And I think, again, if you have confidence in being authentic to who you are, any employer should be willing to take you. Um, Respect, again, I lead, start, end with respect. I'm very much into team. That's just the nature of who I am. That's the background that I come from, from four or five years old playing soccer to then, you know, through college playing on a, on a team is like, that's where the reward, is, I think, you know, when you have people around you that you can actually celebrate with and enjoy what you're doing no matter if it's going through hard times, is that you have somebody on the side of you that's going through the same thing, or you're celebrating whatever it may be, is that that team is really what should be inspiring you, motivating you, pushing you, challenging you, and you be, should be a good teammate to do the same for those others. And then as we get into competitiveness, I am a competitor at heart as well. I wanna win. I got a brand name after winning, so that's just something that's natural to me. And then having fun is like, no matter what, I think, you know, we can't take too many things too serious, especially in the climate today, is that make sure you're having fun, whatever you're doing. Cool. Any questions? So some of my truths, and this is basically what I stand for all the time, is culture is my obsession. So my friends and family would say or describe me as someone that's just embedded in my really immerses itself in culture. Again, I love to travel. I love to learn new things. Huge hip hop head, um, as well as R&B. I love fashion, design, all of that. Like everything that really makes up a culture, like brings texture to, I think, living in these different societies is culture. Pinnacle authenticity is my standard. So again, it goes back to just being yourself. Sports are my accelerator. So again, being just a part of sports all my life, it's something that is an advantage for me because I usually deal with or in, in situations or working in companies or with companies that are around sports. And because of my background, it actually helps me get to where I wanna go or finish whatever project that I'm looking to finish. Global life experiences are my quest. I think you know you really learn more about yourself traveling as well as really seeing the similarities in the world than there are differences between people and cultures and and things of that nature premium is my signature i like premium things but premium how i would explain premium is probably different from people looking at premium i think a lot of them they just look at a, a price tag and think because it's at this price point that it is. Premium for me is just <coughs> exceeding a consumer's expectation. It's as simple as that. I think that's really what premium is because you can find some premium things and some simple things if the consumer is happy or leaves happy. So that's how I kind of define premium. Less, the tr less travel path is my advantage. Um, I think there's something for those that go out and not only challenge themselves, but really get into things that only maybe they might be going down that path. 
um, and no one else can see the, the vision that they have. I serve the community. Again, I am for the people because I was brought up by a family and people of the community. So here are my grand truths as a summary. And then my professional history. So I'll take you through a journey. Um, I'm from San Jose, California. I went to school at Homestead High School and I played basketball and football there. From there, I then graduated and had the opportunity to actually have, uh, sorry, the opportunity to have a scholarship at the University of Oregon, where I played football there for four years, graduated um, with a sports marketing degree. From there, I then went on to intern at Nike for a year, and this was in the middle of the recession in like 2009. So they weren't hiring anyone and my internship was coming to an end and I actually had to go back down to University of Oregon. Um, and because of my relationships there, being a former player and all that, I then did a recruiting internship with the Oregon football team. And that was the first year Chip Kelly was the head coach. Did that for six to eight months and learn fast that I do not want to be a coach at all. Um, the time commitment that they have is beyond, I think anyone can think about just around a sport. That's the thing is like they're waking up at five, maybe in the office and five in the morning and then leaving at 8 p.m. I just graduated from college. I was already on like a, a tough schedule I thought as a student athlete. So then to go back into that a year later and do it all again, but now on the side of where I'm not running around catching footballs or doing anything like that, it was like, yeah, this is not for me. Um, but luckily through the relationships and the network that I was able to build when I was at Nike for my internship, I had the opportunity to go back up to Nike and brand marketing. And that's where I started my career. I did six years in brand marketing, the first, Three was around global athletic training, Nike football, where I was a part of the brand marketing team that launched the NFL and that whole deal, as well as doing some other training things. This was when we were like really trying to get after what Under Armour was doing um, and how they actually became who they became. So it was a part of those initiatives for Nike and the training side, did some baseball things, worked with like Bo Jackson and other athletes around baseball. And then from there, I then moved over into footwear and the Jordan side of things. So working with the Jordan brand, I had the opportunity to be the first PLM for training because of my background in history around not only football and training, but then like the marketing side and what Nike was doing in the training space. Jordan was trying to replicate that. That lasted for a year, Jordan, changed their priorities. There was no more Jordan training. So I then moved over to the sportswear lifestyle side of things. And that's where I was working in retro for probably a year. And then I ended up as we started to get more resources and build out our team of only focusing on Air Jordan ones for three years. So 2017 to 2020 is when I was focused on Air Jordan one. And this was when they weren't looking at it as a franchise. They had it actually grouped in as retros. So the business wasn't how it is structured now. And I can talk through that um, as we go. But with that was no one really paying attention to Jordan 1s. It was kind of an afterthought because they were focused on like the Air Jordan 3, the 4, the 6, the 11, so on and so forth. And I just, thought because actually the Air Jordan one is my favorite shoe. So it was like a dream come true to be working in footwear, working with then also a childhood um, athlete that I loved in Michael Jordan and then creating shoes around that was, you know, because no one was paying attention, I was able to kind of just work with our team and just design things and come up with inspiration and all that. And then as the shoe started to really grow, uh, people started to wear them more and more, the 
business kind of shifted and changed. And now everybody wanted to be in the kitchen, throwing in their own ingredients. And that's where things got a little bit shaky for me. Um, because it became more political than it did around actually the, the consumer and the, and the footwear. From there, I then took off in 2020 and started my own brand, which I was kind of building in the background this whole time and still continue to build around Circle of Winners. And again, as I mentioned before, it's really around the, the, the mentality of winning and what that means. I think everyone defines that in their own terms. And I think also the more that you have that around you as your group, as people that can inspire you, influence and motivate you, the better you are to getting to whatever goals or whatever vision you have. So that's really kind of the, the basis around Circle of Winners. And now I can say officially uh, two weeks ago, I'm now an author, which is wild to say. I uh, uh, appreciate it. I just launched a book called Innovation University and truly the process was as exact as what you guys are going through of creating the shoe. It's the same with the book. You have developers, you're choosing materials, you're choosing ink. All that kind of that goes along with what happens through the, the product creation with, the, with footwear. So do that, it's around the impact and influence that Oregon has had on not only in the game of football, not only sport culture, but pop culture. If you think about the sneakers that Oregon comes out with and how that's a, a, a major kind of commodity and or people just wanting that shoe to fashion with the uniforms and design with the, the, the buildings and architects and all that, that it becomes more of a cultural conversation than it does about just a football team running whatever type of plays and having just fancy uniforms. So we're able to connect with a couple of players, well, a lot of players we interviewed as well as former coaches. Tinker Hatfield was also a part of the, the actual um, process. Um, and yeah, it was myself, another friend who went to Oregon, but he was a little bit younger than me, Carlisle. He's actually the creative director and a creative writer down in LA for the Media Arts Lab. And he did all the writing, as well as then Keone Block, who is a graphic designer, did all the graphics and they both smashed the book. I think it's super dope. I think you haven't seen a book like this maybe in some, some years. We were able to bring in some innovation um, and new technology because of Innovation University. There's also AR in the book, so augmented reality. So you have to download an app if you want to get like a full experience. As you go through some of the pages, 3D animations and or videos pop up um, within the book. So yeah, again, we wanted to really stick and stay on theme with innovation and the title being Innovation University. And then last fall, I actually taught down at the University of Oregon, second year MBA students in sports product, um, a 10 week course, which was cool. It was my first experience. I never, both of these things, like being an author, as well as I guess being a professor, uh, was something that I don't think I had on my roadmap or was really thinking about, but the opportunity presented itself. And for me, again, I like, to experience new things and or challenges and figuring them out and continue to like build off of that to see what else I can get into. So yeah, I took a shot at it. It went pretty well. I think all the students got like A's and B's. I wasn't a hard professor. <laughs> um, and I'll be doing that next fall. Any questions about my career? This is where we can slow things down and talk a little bit. Did you ever get pushed back starting from branding and going to product creation? I did. I got a lot of pushback. It was a... Uh, so, sorry. If it felt like all this happened overnight, it did not. <laughs> at all. This is just now kind of somewhat of a still working product or progress for me. But I had a lot of pushback. At Nike, specifically, I can't speak for other brands, it's very rare for someone to work in brand marketing to then move over to product mar marketing and vice versa and like from product marketing move over to brand marketing. And so because the, the company is so big, you have your own kind of 
network of, of folks of different categories, of different functions that you kind of just work within. And then if you want to get another job in like digital marketing from brand marketing, that's easier than trying to go from brand marketing all the way to product marketing because there's completely two different processes. And so as I was starting to think about moving over, I would sit down and have informationals with people on the product side. And they looked at me as a brand guy. And they're like, yeah, I don't know if there's any spots for you, any positions opening, but just continue to like work the beat and all that. And then on the other side of the brand marketing side, I've done some pretty cool things, I guess they would say. And once I was come, or I would come to them and say, hey, I'm actually looking to make a, a career move within the company, but want to get into product. There was like no, no help. There was no, oh, we don't know anyone in the product side, uh, but we do have this role over in, you know, basketball, if you want to take it, or if you want to go remote, this and that. And I just had my, my eyes and my goals set on product. And it took me probably, I would say two years. I went through three or four different product interviews. And these were some of the roles that I like, I didn't even want to take, but I was just like, I need to get into product. And finally, the, like I said, the opportunity presented itself for Jordan and I was able to get a, a job on that side of things. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it's rare, but I think for, for me, and this is kind of what I just believe in is like, if you want something passionate and strong enough to like go and get it, you know, no matter the time, the time is on you. Things never work out the way that you want it to or the timing that you want it to. But if it's something that you really want, they, it works out. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm curious about Circle of Winners. Okay. And I'm wondering at what point did the seed get into your brain about... That's a great question. I would say... So 2015, there was a group of friends that were all doing like their own thing, like either a couple of friends within the uh, Nike and then other friends that I had around Portland. And we would get together to try to talk about things that we could come together and do, but it never, ever got off the ground. And I think from there, though, the... Have you guys ever read Think Rich or Think and Grow Rich? Napoleon. Yes. And talk about the mastermind. It's as simple as that. It's like the more that you can come together with an alignment and bringing folks together to go after whatever goal is greater than your individual kind of goal. And as things started to go, again, listening to music, there's a song by Currency called No Squares. And I think Wiz Khalifa is also on that song. And some of his, his lyrics like really hit home with me and just the concept of no squares shall enter in the circle of winners. It's like, ah, yes. <laughs> like I have my friends, we all wanna win, this is it. And so that's where I started, I would say like 2015, 16, just like around the idea. And then 2018 is like when I made it official, like I bought an LLC and just had it. And then I started to like just print hoodies and give them away to, to people just because I knew I was really more on like the traditional sides of like just organic guerrilla marketing of people wearing the product and reading the actual brand name that it sticks with them. And then for that is like, okay, I don't want to be another kind of streetwear brand. I think the world has enough of those. It's like, how do we like add value to people like if they do put on some of your your product what's the feeling that they're actually getting what does that mean for them it's like a badge of honor they should be proud to be wearing it and all that so that's what i'm still continuing to work on that no do you have a favorite uh, product you worked on in jordan brand i do great segue so this was the first shoe I ever worked on in when I moved over to Jordan brand training. It was probably the 
between these two were probably the toughest projects I worked on because with this one, I think I had got the job and in two weeks I had to build out a product brief for the most innovative training shoe for Jordan. And I didn't know how to actually create a product brief yet because I was coming from brand marketing. So I took some of like the inspiration around consumer and things of that nature and then worked with other PLMs that were around to kind of then brief in a shoe. And yeah, we got here and I'm sure through your guys' classes and all that, it's not fully everything that I wanted it to be. Like I don't like the jump man on the actual lateral side. I wish, I just don't think the jump man looks good on the lateral side of shoes. I'll just be honest. Um, so it was like, you know, working through what you guys are working through, but um, super proud of this because I think, you know, it did set a tone and for the year that we did have, and it came in different colorways, it came into a low to where there was no longer the booty, it just looked actually like this. Um, that this was probably one of my favorites just because it was the first. The fly knit, another, not an 18 month uh, window as you like to think product is always created. This was, I think, eight months, which was ridiculous because of it being fly knit and us like having to replicate the knit design with the actual shoe and how we wanted texture back here and things of that nature. And I was, this was when I was in retro and then I had just moved over to Jordan ones and someone just handed me this project that they were like, not really working on. It was just a concept at the time um, to where it came to be what it is. And I think it's a sleeper because it's super light, especially during the summer. Um, and, you know, we didn't do a lot of units, but just through the experience and bringing some type of innovation or technology to such a classic silhouette, it's kind of why I like this, this actual um, project. And then this is like my baby. So those that are really into sneakers, this is what we worked on for this was like a one of one for when MJ actually wore the shoe in 85. And it took me, basically when I first got the role in Air Jordan, or for Air Jordan ones. So it took me three years to get this off the, off the ground just because we couldn't find like a true 85. And if we did, we were working through the rest of the line and business. Materials weren't right. Working with color was fine. Engineering wasn't the best. Um, people didn't really understand the concept of like, okay, you guys already have an AJ1 high OG. Why are you trying to do another one that looks... But for me, this was more pure. This was like for the purists that like, everyone calls themselves a sneakerhead. But it's like, we need to reset what Air Jordan 1 means to people. And the only way we do that is by going back to the actual shoe itself, like the first version of it. And it also allowed us to then take a price point and bring an elevated price point to that. So now you're growing the business as well. Distribution changes. So we're wanting to keep it tight and things of that nature. So like just the planning, the, the challenges um, where it landed and the dope thing, because I still have friends that work on the team or around the team, is that they actually are sticking to the plan that I've had back um, in 2020. That, yeah, the, the colorways that are dropping once a year are still gonna do its thing, but like there's a special moment around the 40th anniversary that I'm sure you guys can imagine what that would be because of just celebrating him and, and truly the history of, of the one, so. So we've been talking about, <clears throat> I think in strategy, we were talking about scarcity and exclusivity. Mm -hmm. um, Nike is big on releasing small amounts of shoe and what that means to the consumer. I, I'm sure as someone who's been on the side of like making the shoe, yeah. and being a consumer, yep. the shoe drops and everything. Can you <coughs> I know we were like, we had two sides. Some yeah. people were like, this is the tactic. Some people were like, does it actually grow the business? Like, how do you keep your consumers engaged with yeah. it? So, yeah. 
it's it's all of that. I think you know, great PLMs and or businesses are able to keep consumers engaged because of not only listening to the consumer, but then also like challenging the consumer. So you know, with the the smaller units, is like yes, we know we can put a black red red colorway out every year and they sell out but like is that right for the business and then if we are going to do that how many pairs do we need to do it to keep it to where people still want it after it drops you know um and then as you build out now your product line you have these different price points that then should speak to these different consumers across kind of whatever product line that you're building and if you have three colorways, say for instance, AJ1 High OG. We usually were doing three colorways a season, just for men's. And how I looked at it was, we need to do one that's commercial. So one that like actually takes on majority of the units. We need to do one that sits kind of in the middle that can do a little bit less units. Either it's a familiar blocking familiar uh, material or a twist on something. And then we need to actually take this consumer into a new space and just see what we can do. And that's where you start to see some of these like funky colorways or just deconstructed type of versions and all that. So that you're now hitting on these different consumers that everyone thinks that they're just the only consumer, but it's like, no, we're working across the world of people who call themselves consumers for the Jordan 1. So how do we kind of please each of them or at least kind of give them a taste of someone who's more fashion forward and wants to not look like everyone else and wants to wear whatever the new thing is or someone that's like in the in between is like, yeah, I understand the fashion forward things, but I'm more kind of classic or whatever it may be or I sit in between and then like the class is like, yo, I just need that pair all the time. And so with that, is then how do you then build the business and what are the targets that you have to hit? Because now you have to do that for whatever else skews that you have and, and all that. Does that make sense? It's like, how do you, you could lose people if they're constantly not winning these, like, is it like draws? Like, oh, on sneakers and all that? So I might as well not try. But you gotta think, the business, is predicated on those colorways or those drops by energy. So just about like what's happening out and people running to try to get those. But the foundation of a business is usually like these foundational shoes that are like 100 to like $150 to where it's like, as long as we have that covered and no one's not running away from not wanting to buy those, we can continue to work on what the right amount of units is, the right price point is with this, I would say one to five, 10%. Retro is a little bit different though, because they take up, I think it's changed now, but I want to say like 40% of the business and Jordan ones is like 40%. And then you have 20% of every, other footwear that's in the, the portfolio. But it's it's a, actually I'll get into it. Um, this is another quote by H, if you guys don't know him. But product marketing, this can kind of transition into also what you're talking about. Does anyone want to define what product marketing is? There's no right or wrong answer. So you want to, TCU. <laughs> I I come from digital product marketing. Got it. So it's a little different. I think it's the same. Let's see. Um, <laughs> and there's no right or wrong answer again. Um, I feel like it's it's getting the right product in front of the right people intentionally. I'm with you. I'm right with you. I think it's creating the right product at the right place at the right time, the right person. I'm loving these answers.
maybe the story and the connection to the summers. Anyone else? Yeah. Making sure that the information you're trying to convey to the consumer is digestible. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Understood. I would say getting people to care about the products that you're making. Creating and communicating the why and the why. Mm. Yeah. The great thing is, all your guys' answers are right. And I think the best thing about it is, like, as long as you can define what product marketing is, is really all that matters, because that's what's going to drive you to build whatever product that you're, you're actually looking to build. And so for me, I looked at it as the art and science of identifying the insight that leads to the creation and position of a product in a market that serves a consumer's need. So you guys were all right. I appreciate it. You guys are learning some things in here. <laughs> so I'm gonna leave you guys with some of the major keys around product and we can continue to talk, but these are my product kind of marketing keys of what I always try to stay true to and try to continue to um, work through as I was working in product is being authentic. And I think that's really not only to yourself, but to the team, as well as whatever product that you're actually creating is the product being authentic for your consumer. Appreciate the consumer. Um, and by appreciating, I think, you know, caring for that consumer, actually understanding what that consumer, those consumer needs are because at the end of the day, they are buying your product. So the more that you can appreciate the consumer, the more that you can actually have a relationship with the consumer, the more that you can think through all your product and the process with your consumer, the better you are with the product that you're creating. Storytelling is king. I love storytelling. Everyone in here has a story to tell, and so does the product. And I think, you know, when you do it right, that some of you actually are, is a part of the product that you're creating and the stories that you want to tell. Be curious. Be curious. Don't ever get stagnant or complacent or just happy that you guys have produced a product that's doing well. It's like, how do you continue to be curious, curious what's more out there? What can inspire you outside of whatever the product that you're working on? Because I, I, I've gained inspiration from all types of things, cars, animals, um, all of that, that pours into the product that you're looking to build. Respect those before you. I think that's a major thing. Everyone wants to come in and think that they are creating a new will when there's been a will for 50 years. And I'm saying that for Nike is like, use that and those, those connections and or if you have them to reach out and talk to, to see what they were able to do, what was right, what was wrong how they see the market maybe moving or where they see product is going um, because it will influence and affect what you're doing. Be a leader who can follow. Uh, a lot of people, especially as a product line manager or marketer, you are the quarterback, you're the point guard, you're leading the product creation process. And so for you, you have to work with other teammates and the great thing and not so great thing about being a product manager is that you don't control anything if you think about it. You have a material designer who actually controls the material. You have a color designer who actually controls the color. You have engineers that controls the actual production or the development of the shoe. You have a developer, this and that. You are just supposed to shepherd them to get your ideas across, to get you know them all on the same team and so with that there may be some times that if a color designer wants to do a specific color and you're not feeling it is taking your personal feelings out of it and doing what's better for the team because then now that color designer will look to help you when you actually really need it or whatever it may be of like now we go back you know two months later and we're going through another discussion or debate on what color is like hey I let you rock out with this last color. Help me on this next one, you know? And so that's where I think, you know, being able to follow and lead at times is something that a lot of PLMs sometimes forget. Um, 
but the more that you can keep that in mind, the better it is for the team and the, and the product. Build for the future. I'm one of those people that really don't like rear view mirrors. It's just what's ahead. <coughs> Focus on solutions. As you being kind of the center spoke of the product creation and the process is everyone's going to be coming to you with questions, with problems, with challenges, and you have to be the one there with some solutions. And it doesn't mean you have to have the answers. It's just start to work through the solutions. Hey, maybe color needs to connect with material more, or maybe material should go out to the factories with development and focus on this or whatever it may be. Is that really focus on the solutions because no one wins when you're, you're just sitting there and people are looking for you and looking for direction and leadership and there is none because the product doesn't move then. Stay inspired. Stay inspired. I think that's what drives a lot of people to do what they do, especially at a high level, is inspiration. And the last but least, not least, is put in the work. As much as it may seem like, again, these were easy, simple thoughts and ideas. It like took me a lot of time, a lot of data collecting, a lot of conversations, a lot of meetings, a lot of searching on the web, a lot of being curious, a lot of just a lot of things to get then to whatever the final product was or whatever we, we put out. I won't read this whole thing, but I will leave you with a quote of a master in the art of living. And this goes back again to just things that I'm passionate about. I don't see a difference between like my career and my personal life. Like it's me, it's who I am. So it kind of influences everything. And that's really what it just talks about. The, the art of living is making sure that you guys are doing something that you enjoy, um, that you love getting up to do, uh, and that you, you know, just continue to, to be happy around and really have fun and, and grow. With that, thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> Any additional questions? Um, thanks for coming to speak to us. Um, it's kind of a full circle moment. I, where you, I just had a couple questions about products, specifically on the knit. Um, yep. Um, what were some of the uh, like developmental issues that you had to bring that to life, um, considering that it's like a material that compresses and moves, you know, have a different last, different tooling? So it was all of that, literally. Like we had to change the last. If you have bought a pair, you probably noticed that. Well, you didn't notice because we actually changed this. But our last, we had to change it to where if we would have kept it on the original last, a size twelve. But it felt, felt like a size 13. So we told them to go forward with that. But through the end of the, the, the development, it's like, we'll change, we'll just shift the sizing. So make sure the factory understands what is a 12 is an 11. And, but, you know, like, and going through that whole process, as well as like the, the leather being able to actually get sewn through without ripping. Um, the toe box, again, leather lining against um, the fly knit. Certain leathers were actually melting. The, like they were basically melting together, like the leather and the fly knit together and all that. So it was a process, man. Yeah. I have other questions, but I'll let people. <laughs> we'll bring it, we'll go here and then come back up to you, yeah. I have a question about product marketing. Uh, so for you, how do you find, I may completely butcher this, but how, how do you find the, the balance between, I guess, telling a story because you have a story to tell or telling a story to sell a product and it coming off as gimmicky or finding the balance between, hey, here's a, product that performs and it'll speak for itself. It yeah. Really like yeah. Or say like, ex I'm thinking about Jordan examples, but say a shoe that comes out and 
people have given it a nickname, but because this nickname is, you need to pay licensing fees for other companies, yeah. like say a false narrative around it because you don't want to pay that licensing fee. Yeah. Or, you know, going with a certain narrative, a false narrative because it'll sell. Right. And not being. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it, you know, a lot of it d depends on, I always start with authenticity. Authenticity. So if it feels authentic to you, it should feel then authentic to the consumer. But if you're working through product and you're like, ah, that's a stretch what we're about to tell the story. It's like the consumer is, we're consumers. So we're smart. Like we understand when a brand or a company is putting out some BS product or the story is not actually a true story. And you get the backlash, which is real time now. Um, Instagram and Twitter should be your guys' friend in the product. Uh, but you have to be able to understand the filters and have filters of what's real and then what's just people just saying, you know? Um, so I would say that. And then it goes to the consumer, it goes back to the consumer. Like we actually never named any of our Jordan 1s when I was there. I don't know if they're doing it now or whatever. We would just allow the consumer to decide. Like, again, we had inspiration and we wanted that to speak for itself, then kind of leading the consumer to something that maybe that wouldn't connect with them or resonate with them. So I think if you think about like a bread or not even, we'll say, what was it called? The bread toe, if you guys know that colorway. So it was basically like two colorways of a Jordan one put together in one. We didn't come up with that name of Bread Toe. Consumers came up with that name. And that's then how it kind of was marketed and how it went out because with Nike, obviously there's like leaks and things of that nature or you start to preview whatever the footwear is. And that's where they started to build. But we always stayed authentic to the, the story and the inspiration and allowed consumers to kind of take it. Because after that, it's not ours anymore. It's like, it's the world just to, they do what, as they please with, with the product. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Thanks again for coming in. Yeah. Um, happy to have you here, excited. Appreciate you being here. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, or ask a little bit about, you said you don't like to look in the rear view mirror, but I think a big part of the Jordan 1 legacy, yeah. the Jordan 1 brand is legacy. Mm -hmm. So looking at the legacy that the Jordan has come out with and thinking now to your own brand, how are you trying to set a legacy with what you do? And how does that sort of, how does the craftsmanship and like on drawing back on the legacy from the Jordan 1 line tie into what you want to do? Yeah. And I would say this, you will contradict yourself. <laughs> but let me tell you, with the Jordan 1s, I, there was a business need and then there was a, I think a consumer slash um, how would I say this? There was a business need and then there was a, a future need. And so with the Jordan 1, obviously it's a shoe that's been around for 35, 40 years. I knew that we can again put out these type of colorways. So I never actually focused on these colorways. Like when I would sit down with our color designer and materials, I was like, how can we create something and how far can we go and take these new designs or these colorways as far as until the consumer tells us, yo, you guys are bugging, like enough with it. And so I was again, always looking forward with like new colorways, new materials, because I know we can do this in our sleep. Like this is heritage. This is authentic to us. This is who we are. This is what everyone knows. So as long as we go back to that, we'll be fine. It's how do we actually grow the business? How do we get out of just a retro colorway of just people wearing red, black, and white? And so that's where I was continuing to build and try to push our designers and working with merchandise. That was like, uh, I don't know if you guys, any merchandisers are in here, um, but that is probably one of the, <laughs> the main relationships that you guys have to be aligned. And if you're not aligned, they can make, well, for Nike, they can make your life very challenging because they're coming back with these targets that you have to hit. 
and you're creating something new. And it's like, I have belief that this new creation will still hit that target. And they're like, no, give us just more of this colorway. Give us another one of this or just flip the swoosh out with a white or something like that. Because they were just trying to hit a number. They were just trying to make sure that they actually provided their distribution channels with you know, shoes that they felt comfortable selling. And for us, it was like, no, we've been there, we've done that. So it, yeah, you know, again, the contradiction came in like, yes, we, we continue to put out colorways, but for me personally, what I was working in on the day to day was more about forward. Hi, uh, Garrett, yeah, thank you so much for coming and talking. And so Drew asked you a question about your uh, legacy of the past. And I want to ask you a question about uh, the future. So uh, I want to ask, like, what sports that you're really interested in that you would want to dive in next? And would uh, will we see a Circle of Winners become a brand that's associated to these sports? Yes. So again, Circle of Winners is a, a lifestyle brand and I say lifestyle because I truly mean it, is that it won't just be a apparel brand. I'm looking to actually get into traveling and creating some type of platform and, and traveling, as well as some other things. So sports like branding, like an agency of management, but more around empowering and educating like student athletes and really getting them to understand what branding is, uh, especially way more now earlier in the game. But, and so now I can also, I remembered the second part of your question. Um, so with Circle of Winners, I am building its foundation right now, still building its foundation. So I'm sure at some point I'll go back and do some historical things of where I started when I was like, I'll always have probably a black and white hoodie in line or a black and white hat in line because it's true and authentic to circle winners and I know that's what people love but I'm also then looking for what are those other colorways that I'll be able to to build but with you like with the sports I'm really into premier and international soccer and go Arsenal go Gunners hopefully we can finish <laughs> off the finish off the season above Man City um but for me it's like looking for partners and collaborations that fit within like the circle of winners ethos. So that can be from traveling to sporting clubs and or teams um, to music or whatever it may be. But as long as it kind of fits within circle of winners uh, ethos, we would definitely look to collaborate. Um. I know people keep asking about future and past. Sorry, I'm gonna. Oh, good. <laughs> so we talked about respect those before you, and then also build for the future. I feel like right now we're at an interesting point, um, especially in these big brands, because we have people who've been there for like 25 plus years. Mm -hmm. We've been doing things this way, and we should stick this to this. And then we also have a generation that wants to push the needle on innovation, yep. want to try new things and stuff like that. How do you? And now these two types of groups or however are now working in the same place. Mm -hmm. How do you bridge that gap of, yeah, respecting the things that we've done, but also trying to push that needle on innovation and convince them that, hey, we need to go in this direction? Yeah, I think you start with communication. I think that kind of rules everything is like if you're able to communicate with someone and that's like sitting down, talking with them, understanding their point of view you giving your point of view, and then hopefully you guys find somewhere in, in the middle. But it's it's that. I, I think right now, to your point, there are, I guess we can call it the old guard that wants to hang on to whatever has been going on. And then you have the newbies and or the ones that are trying to push the limit. And it's like, how do we kind of take the learnings that you guys have and the experience that you have but let us bring you into and or, you know, come with us in this direction. But I think it first starts with like sitting down. Like I actually had a real life example with, or I have a real life example with my manager that I left. Um, he was there for 30 years, 25, 
20, 20, 20 years, 20 years, sorry, 20 years. And he worked in like Nike basketball in the 90s where it was like popping, early 2000s. And so he had in his mind how product should go, the process, how we should lead, you know, how we're working with merchandise and all that. And me and him used to bump heads all the time. Like I could not stand him, but I love making products. So I'm like, I'm not going to pay attention to him, but it's hard to do that when, you know, that's someone that you actually have to report to or that you have to lead and, or talk with and all that to where finally towards actually it happened like towards the back end of my um, time there. I just went in there. It was like our, our weekly meeting. I was like, instead of me kind of saying what he was doing wrong, I asked him, what do you think that I'm doing wrong? Like, what, what's your point of view on how you see things? And from there, it opened up. He's like, well, you know, this is how we used to, this and that. And then I would just ask questions back. Is that the same consumer that you think we're talking about today? Is that the same process? Is, are, are those the same distribution channels that we're working with? Has anything evolved and all that? And then we got to a point where it's like, oh, he trusted me of making decisions and or I would just go to him now to kind of double check. But then we got to a great point where, again, the business that I worked on with the Air Jordan Ones, when I walked in, it was 250 million a year in revenue. By the time I was taking off, it was a billion dollars in revenue. And that was in three years. Um, and so I think us working together, because he did teach me some things around just how to build product um, with like the numbers and like the, the budget that we have, things of that nature. So, but yeah, it, it takes some time. I think it's communication though is the, the biggest thing. Can you kind of talk about uh, the nuances between telling an authentic story from a brand's point of view that has like history and like things that people you know rely on and then trying to tell that story from a new perspective? Mm. Yeah, um, which I'm sure you've seen it a lot with Jordan and it's a, I think it's a, a fine line, but when they do it right, think of like, what you I'm trying to think of, the, the 11, I think the white, black 11, like that was, we all know, like internally, we knew what the inspiration was and we knew kind of where it came from, why the design was it, what it was, but how they actually was able to market it and work with product was then what does that mean in today's age and with the new consumer? And from there, they built out, you know, bringing in kind of younger influencers and or celebrities that just had an infatuation with, of like greatness, you know? So now that speaks to a broader group, uh, a modern group, a new group, than just speaking about MJ's greatness. You know, you bring in a Travis Scott, you bring in you know, uh, Laylee May, you bring in whatever Hoopers and all that to like tell a modern day story that's actually grounded and anchored in the history of, of, of Jordan. But sometimes it doesn't work, you know? Sometimes people would just call like, yo, that's whack. Why didn't you just tell us the origin story? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Do you feel like oftentimes, like as you was in various roles, you had like a advantage I guess you could say as just being someone of the culture like you like you're in it every day like you you know what the people want so like just trying to like convince that to people on your team you feel like they necessarily necessarily not really understand what's going on so it just kind of maybe a little frustrating do you feel like you kind of had like advantage every day <laughs> that was every day that was like my fight like I was like made at a point like yo I'm going in here to speak for the consumers and what's happening out in like the streets and all that. Um, and I was able to do so successfully by bringing, always bringing it back to the consumer of bringing in, whether it was like um, a list of tweets or reactions to a, a release, or if it was like a music video that just dropped, or if there were references and things of that nature, it was like, as much as I was like, standing on that hill, I was also trying to educate those on what's going on so that we can actually make more sound decisions or so they can understand why we're making the decisions that we're making or we're trying to make the decisions. 
But every day it was that. Because again, you do have people that may have been in the role for 10 to 20 years or in that, that um, function. And yeah, you know, their lifestyles are completely different from mine. Like you're older, you have a family, you've been here for 20, I'm single, I go out, I hang out, you know, I travel. So it's like, having to educate them and, and bring them along. I think that was like probably one of the, I didn't learn this until the end of my career, was that it's like, people feel so much better about your ideas when you include them, you know? It's like sharing early on um, so that they can kind of get a sense and feel like they've been a part of whatever you're, you're creating. So one of your values is being authentic. Mm -hmm. You resonate with that. But a lot of people define authenticity in different ways. Yep. Um, this is a two-part question. A, can you define what authentic authenticity means to you? And B, um, as someone who's come from a different country, sometimes being yourself is not really appreciated or accepted. Mm -hmm. And if you struggle with that, how do you navigate it in the industry? Yeah. I think being authentic for me, if I was to define it, um, is having pure intentions. And that's like with yourself, and that's with like the people around you or how you engage with, with people, how do you interact with people. Um, I can't give you like a, a more defined definition than that, but I'm thinking, I think just around pure intentions of like, you set out to be who or to do what. And if that's what you are kind of staking your claim and wanting to do, then that's how you're showing up. That's how you are being authentic to yourself. And for those that, and then the second part was. If you, you struggle with being yourself. How yeah. Do you um, I meditate a lot. I, um, I also know that not everything is for me. And I also, communicate that I may not be for you. I may not be the person for you. I mean, like that job may not be for me. I may not be for that job. And that's the, the confidence again of knowing that you've made it to this point, doing it in the sense your way is that things will always figure it, always figure itself out. Um, and it, it is, it's, it's a challenge, it's a struggle. Um, there's a lot of frustrations, but the more you can bring it back to like who you are, your core, and really lean on those that are, you know, appreciating you for being who you are, I think the better you are and the better that the world is. Um, especially then if you're going into a company, it's like, if you want the best out of me and actually performance, it's like, then let me be me. You know, you can't force me into something because that never works either. Like now you just got two frustrated people trying to work together or 10 frustrated people. <laughs> so, and being a former athlete and understanding after doing some research that you had, you worked with some of the stuff uh, for Oregon with NIL mm -hmm. and then kind of ba uh, based off of Nick's question with looking into the future, how do you feel you know, with trying to find those athletes that you feel like would embody what Circle of Winners is about and how do you feel like you can incorporate that going into the future after building the foundation? Yeah. Um, so how we would approach things or how we've been thinking through approaching things is really based on, um, I think the character of the athlete. Like we want to start there obviously if you're doing well in your, your sport and all that, but it's like the character of an athlete and the athlete that is actually open to learning. Cause I'm sure there's some ex athletes in here. There can be those athletes that, you know, have been great at what they've been doing for so long and everyone's been just giving them things in the sense of like praise and money now and cars and whatever it may be is like, are these athletes starting to look at themselves as being more than an athlete? Are they understanding that, yeah, what you're doing on the field or court is cool,
but you know you can actually expand that and do so much more. Like you look at LeBron James, it took him some time, but that would be the best example. It was like for the longest, he was just looked at as a basketball athlete. It wasn't until these last five or six years, maybe, um, that him and his his team actually like bossed up and like started to create all these different channels. Rich Paul goes off and does this. Mav Carter goes off and did that. But they all knew it was because of like the nucleus of LeBron and LeBron understanding how he his power and where he's at can actually go beyond just that that sport. And so for us, it's like trying to identify those type of athletes that start to already think about or understand that there's something bigger than me just throwing a football or catching a football or shooting a basket. That's a two-parter, so very okay. good. These two-part questions are great. <laughs> um, so kind of going back to authenticity and your passion for culture, uh, a lot of the products that we see from companies are based on, you know, black culture, yep. our stories, our narratives, things like that. Um, has there ever been a time where you presented something um, that was authentic to you and the culture and you received pushback? And then on the flip side of that, have you ever um, received anything that wasn't authentic and kind of how did you navigate that? Yeah. Um, I did. So, yes. But this wasn't just specifically to like black culture. It was to culture. So in... We were working on the 35th anniversary for the Jordan ones. Everybody wanted to make it this big thing because of the anniversary. If you don't know, Jordan brand loves anniversaries. Um, and so I came up with the, the concept around actually celebrating the communities because how we were building our line, these shoes were these set in different communities at different times and that it wasn't just one consumer or one community that was like celebrating or loving the shoe. And so my idea was like, how do we get to these less representative communities and actually celebrate them as well as take these, some of these colorways or these shoes that would be exclusive <laughs> for an anniversary and bringing them into more of like a, um, in a cost effective way of like, Collaboration shouldn't only be on Air Jordan 1 high OGs, like mids. We should have collaborations for mids. If you guys don't know, like that's more of our baseline um, product in the in the franchise. It's like, and then from there, it's like, okay, well, let's get like DJ Khaled. Let's like, no, that's not the point. Like DJ Khaled's not wearing a mid, nor do we want him collaborating on a mid. Like for us to not only grow the business, but continue to like elevate what we're doing is like, we need to bring in more folks and actually have them feel a part of, of, of the brand. Cause that's the thing is like, people wear Jordans because it's a validation, but like they wanna feel a part of greatness. And we should not only have that at like the highest level or the top tier product, like that should be throughout everything that we do is like, if I'm wearing anything Jordan, I should feel great. And so, I, I challenged our team, like our global marketing team, as well as our merchandise team to reach out to our geo partners and see if they can identify an influencer and or some local um, brand that has defined greatness or has been fearless in what they've been doing. And everyone came back with like these big names. And I'm like, yo, we already did those collaborations. We already did this and that. And from there, it really did show me how much one people were disconnected with their own kind of geo or how numbers driven they were for something that was supposed to be more creative and celebratory and not be about numbers, you know? Um, but it, and then this was happens. Finally get to a great point, get the collaborators. This is where we like, brought out all different types of collaborations. And next thing you know, now everyone's like, oh yeah, you know, they were a part of, internally, they were now presenting the work as if they had came up with the idea and that they were along with it. And for me, it's just like, I think it's just, it's affirmation 
and reconfirming what I know and what my intentions were. So yeah, I looked at it like, yo, that's weird. That's weird old behavior. But then I also thought about it as like, hey, I did, like they wanted to be a part of it. Like that was a success. So that was just another kind of point on the, the scoreboard for me. I'm building on Asia's point. Um, for someone like you who loves to travel and like I've always had this feeling that kind of um, got uh, got solidified when I traveled also that is that like America's greatest export right now or has been for the last 500 years is black culture, black swag, mm -hmm. hip hop, jazz, everything. Um, so how do you, in, in this day and age with globalization and the internet and everything kind of like being copied or just kind of appropriated, like how do you um, stay true um, when building your brand and knowing that like, you know, you have hopes to like maybe become a global brand, maybe right. go into different spaces um, that aren't necessarily black and like kind of keeping that authenticity. Yeah. Yeah, for me, like if I can't, walk into a place and or work with someone or collaborate with someone as who I am, then it's, it's pretty simple for me. Like, I'm good on passing on that, that business because um, it means more to me of being authentic and being someone that isn't trying to appropriate or like just get off by a, a dollar than it does of, again, like adding value to, to someone. Like, I don't want to get to a point where people just feel like it's a it's a cash grab for my my product or just the brand it's like oh no like things are curated like there was story behind that they took their time they've been intentional of the product that they put out and less of like let me get out to as much as i can as fast as i can because i know i'm black and that's what everyone's looking for you know and it's tough again like all this is I go through it every day I have to think through it. I have to, you know, sit with it, have conversations with, with friends and or advisors, mentors. Um, but it, it does go back to, again, yourself. I think self-awareness is the biggest gift you can give yourself. And as long as you, you stay close to who you are and understanding your surroundings and what's for you and what's not for you, I think that's always the, the right path, if there's a right path. Can you speak to your journey on like transitioning from like being in a well-established like company to being an entrepreneur? Yeah. Starting something on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> corporations, you know, benefits. I'm paying for health insurance now, and it is killing me. It is killing me. Uh, but I really, I took a lot of the learnings from from Nike, because I, I think it is a, a school of Jedis. I think you can't get any better than Nike. Like I would never discourage anyone that has an opportunity to work at Nike to work at Nike, because a lot of the things are invaluable that you learn. And you're around like some of the most creative and genius type of people there are. So for me, I just tried to be a sponge and take as much as I can to now, with those tools and skills, bring it into what I'm doing now and going back to that. So like, if I do feel like I'm like misaligned or off, I kind of go back to like the foundational things that I've learned at Nike because, you know, they're a $50 billion company and I was a part of that. Uh, and so like, how can I get just my slice, my piece of the pie? And what are those things that I can do to, to influence what I have going on? And with that, I really want to say we really do appreciate your time, Garen. And if you'll stick around, I believe that we still have some refreshers and drinks outside as well for a little happy hour after from what I believe. But um, from the on behalf of the UO Sports Product Management Program, we really appreciate you sharing your story and being able to share your time with us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Cool. Thank you, sir.